Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so today, as explained, I'm going to give a brief presentation to highlight some of the legal action taken against mass surveillance by civil society in the UK since the Snowden revelations. I'll first go through a brief timeline of case since, cases since the Snowden disclosures and then explain in more detail um, some, uh, one of the cases, which is the 10 Human Rights Org case against the UK, which is the one that's going to be in Strasbourg on Tuesday. And then finally, I'll go over some of the things that have been achieved through civil society litigation in this area and discuss some of the pros and cons of litigation as a tool for change in the context of mass surveillance. Um, and then we'll have a, a Q&A after that. So as you all know, in uh, 2013, um, as a result of the information uh, disclosed by Edward and Snowden, um, we found out a lot more than we knew before about the indiscriminate mass surveillance of the NSA and GCHQ. Um, mass surveillance in itself viol violates both the right to privacy and freedom of information, and some of the practices that were um, identified and expanded upon by uh, the Snowden revelations um, are these, many of which you'll already be familiar with, but just briefly. So you have bulk interception, which is where the government taps high-capacity fibre optic cables, um, which carry the world's internet communication. Um, the UK is a natural landing hub for, most, for many of these cables. Um, and what we found out from the Snowden revelations was that the UK government, often with the cooperation of um, telecommunications companies, have attached probes to these cables to intercept their traffic. Um, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about the 10 Human Rights Org case. Also, intelligence sharing, we found out more about the secret, secret arrangements um, whereby states share their intelligence, including um, more information about the Five Eyes Alliance and how these are often used to circumvent domestic and international rules on direct surveillance. Also, um, GCHQ's hacking capabilities. It was revealed that GCHQ could activate a device's microphone or webcam, identify the location of a device with high precision, log keystrokes entered into in a device, um, collect login details and passwords for websites, and record internet browsing histories on a device, and also hide mal malware installed in a device. Um, and finally, I also mentioned bulk data retention, as this is a, an intrinsically linked um, activity, which is the wholesale and indiscriminate retention of personal data, which it makes it more vulnerable to um, abuse through mass surveillance. So here's a timeline of some but not all of the cases that have um, been raised since 2013 in the Snowden disclosures. Um, they are UK focused. There's been many other challenges around the world um, by many civil society organisations. And these are just some that Privacy International and other civil society organisations such as Amnesty International um, and ORG have been involved in. So the, the first one that was really raised following the Snowden disclosures was 10 Human Rights Org, which as you can see is still going on today. This is where um, Privacy International um, and other NGOs filed complaints with the Investigatory Powers Tribunal challenging uh, the UK's bulk interception of data and also the access of the UK intelligence services to foreign intelligence information in this, in this way as well. And I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. Another challenge um, was a, a hacking challenge, essentially, to, to the um, capabilities that I just mentioned. And that, as well, was a, ch uh, a challenge raised before the Investigatory Powers Tribunal challenging GCHQ. And there, for example, Privacy International was joined by internet service providers um, in challenging these hacking operations and these activities, both as a breach of the Computer Misuse Act, which criminalises hacking, but also um, Articles 8 and 10 of the European Convention, so your right to private life and the right to freedom of expression. And um, here, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal has found that actually this is lawful in principle, and they've relied on these thematic warrants um, that are permitted under the Intelligence Services Act, which cover entire... Um, classes of unidentified persons and places of property. So, for example, it would legitimise hacking all mobile phones in an entire city. So this is something that Privacy International continues to challenge, um, both through judicial review and an application to the European Court of Human Rights. 
One of the other challenges I mentioned here is a, an FOI challenge. This relates to intelligence sharing. And when we pursued a, um, a number of FOI requests ar around the world to the different Five Eyes jurisdictions, G um, in the UK, GCHQ responded um, with a blanket exemption of freedom of information legislation um, with the explanation that they are exempt from any obligation to be transparent about their activities. And they also applied this exemption when we made um, FOI requests in relation to mundane information, such as their cafeteria menu. So this is ongoing as well and is being challenged in the European Court of Human Rights as incompatible with Article 10. Um, I also mentioned here some of the data retention cases. They're not explicitly linked to the Snowden revelations, but they are um, a key example of where there has been a successful litigation against um, data retention. And many of you will have heard of Digital Rights Ireland and then Watson, um, where both the EU and um, UK frameworks have been challenged um, on the basis that they're not, um, they don't fulfil the necessary legal tests of legality, necessity and proportionality. So um, on to 10 Human Rights Org, which, as I mentioned, is being heard um, in Strasbourg on Tuesday. So this was a case, um, as I mentioned, brought by 10 human rights organisations, and it's now been joined with two other cases, one uh, brought by Big Brother Watch and Org, um, an English pen, and also another one brought by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism and another party. Uh, this case is important. It raises novel and important issues of law and principle, as it is the first time that um, the European Court of Human Rights will be called upon to address directly the question of whether surveillance on the scale that we're now seeing should be permitted, and the minimum safeguards as well that are needed to meet the standard required by um, the European Convention in um, in the context of digital communication. And it really challenges the UK's right, as I said, to intercept in bulk any communication that just happens to traverse the UK to store um, these communications, and as well, um, in both the content and the related communications data. And also, it challenges the UK's right to, to obtain similar bulk access to communications and data intercepted by intelligence services of other states. Um, as part of this challenge, we're challenging Section 8.4 of RIPA, which is basically um, an interception warrant regime. And it really doesn't meet the minimum standards that have been identified by the court um, continuously in its case law. So this is something that um, is ongoing. And as I say, we'll um, be together with a number of the civil society organizations in this room um, in Strasbourg on Tuesday. I think that the key principle to take out of it is that um, mass surveillance is, is unlawful and, and the, the legal regime in the UK today is, is completely inadequate. And it's been a long time coming. It started in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal in 2013 and there's been a number of judgments there and we're now having the hearing in 2017. So these are just some infographics to try and explain um, how bulk interception works. Um, and many of you may be familiar with the technical side of this anyway, but it's one of the challenges in raising litigation is um, raising awareness um, and understanding of the issues involved in litigation. Um, and it, it can be challenging given the secret, n secret nature of m much of this information. But um, what we're challenging with bulk interception is, is this... Um, access to these communications as they um, bounce around the world. And, and we're getting across to the court that develops, developments in technology have fundamentally changed the way we communicate. And the distinctions that have previously made, been made between internal and external communications in a country no longer um, are no longer the same. For example, if I send a communication to Rachel, um, it will bounce around the world many times. Um, and it's not just limited to this room. And just briefly to mention this again is, is another explanation of how bulk the different stages of, of bulk interception. So you've got the inter interception, and that's really where you've got your first violation of your rights privacy, uh, the fact that all of our communications are, are intercepted in that way. Then you have extraction 
filtering, storage, analysis, and dissemination, which is when the information is shared. So um, just briefly in terms of achievements, and that, these are things that when you are pursuing litigation and thinking of litigation as a successful tool for change that you are often looking for, um, I think it's, um, litigation is probably one of the more successful tools for change, but it's also important to be wary that it can at times be um, a bit of a double-edged sword. So um, often you, you would measure success through the courts declaring practices illegal, and that has happened to an extent in the um, bulk inception cases um, where, with the IPT de declaring that these practices were illegal at the time they were not um, known. And also, for example, in, in data retention um, and the, the Watson case, for example. Um, and you have to counterbalance that with um, issues such as some of the problems with, with the investigative parish tribunal and the secret nature of it as a, as a court. Um, and also the, the fact that just because a court declares, practice, declares a practice illegal, it won't necessarily always promote, provoke immediate change. And that is something that we've kind of been looking at with the data retention cases and how member states in the EU have followed up on those judgments. Um, another issue to look at is um, codes of practice and whether these um, are something that, that are positive um, or not. And again, it's about looking at them with close scrutiny and, and they're not always the solution. There's been codes of practice published under a RIPA, which is the current, um, which with the, the previous kind of practices. Um, and there's also draft codes of practice under the IP Act, and these are not in any way perfect. Um, also in terms of, of legislative change, um, we know that there was, uh, you know, all those, the challenges that we face with the Investigatory Powers Act um, becoming law. Um, but it is important as well to be vigilant and scrutinize legislation, both um, whilst going through Parliament and afterwards um, and this can also be done by way of litigation. For example, you've got the Data Protection Bill, which is making its way through Parliament at the moment, um, and where civil society are again coming together to look at the issues it poses. And, for example, the, um, the blanket exemptions that it offers to um, intelligence services. So, in terms of like the pros and cons of... Um, litigation in this field. Um, I think there's, there's more positives um, than negatives, but it is always important to be aware um, if you are in civil society and thinking about using litigation as a tool for change of um, the challenges in terms of the resources. It's very resource intensive, it's costly, and it's slow. As we've seen with the 10 Human Rights Org case, that's been going on for years. Um, and it, and, but I mean, it is a, it's a key tool. It's a key tool for um, having practices declared illegal for provoking legislative change and um, also for um, bringing organisations together to, to create a kind of stronger front on an issue um, and also transparency. I think one of the key issues um, and key achievements throughout this litigation since 2013 has been transparency. Thanks to the litigation by civil society, we do have a much stronger understanding of the, the practices and we're then able to challenge them more effectively. Um, so it's just a, a, about kind of weighing up all those issues. But um, it is an ongoing fight, and many of the cases I mentioned are still ongoing, such as the 10 human rights organizations. So um, it's undoubtedly important to use litigation as a tool to, to challenge these practices that infringe um, our human rights, um, particularly the right to privacy and freedom of expression. So. Yeah, I think that's um, all I wanted to say. And um, Rachel and I are happy to take questions. I think we will encourage the women in the room to put their hands up because this is the first all-female panel I've been on in a while, small as it is. And hurrah for that. Thank you all. Um, particularly, of, uh, so I work across the domestic rights spectrum at Amnesty and I'm very much not a tech expert. So if anyone's got detailed tech questions, please don't direct them to me. But this is one of the areas where it's uh, actually hardest to find women who are out there and speaking on it. So women, please not to discourage the men, but if there are any women who ask questions, go for it. No, come on. <laughs> we won't bite, I promise. <laughs> There's one over there at the back. Okay. Stop. 
Hi, thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. It really makes me terribly nostalgic because we all learned about Snowden revelations uh, together in OrgCon 2013. And I still remember sitting with John Perry Barlow drinking lots of beer in a shock that he is actually American. I think he just couldn't believe that that's what it means to be American on that day. But since then, you know, we fought very, very hard work, but I think the conclusions probably quite depressing that because the situation mm -hmm. outside is getting worse and the number of attacks are getting harder, the excuses to continue with increased bulk surveillance times million are there every day in the paper. So are we barking at the right tree? I mean, yes, is the answer. I mean, there is no other tree. So I've spent the past couple of years, I mean, I've been at Amnesty since 2014, which was when this litigation really got going. And I can tell you that although it's been slow and taken a long time, this is the only area in which we've managed to get change. So precisely because of that external environment you're talking about and the way we've seen increased attacks, the sad reality is that then what you find is when you're in Parliament trying to encourage MPs to change the law directly, all you get is a blank wall of fear because they don't want to be the ones to stick their neck out and go against something which the intelligence services are calling for openly in case something else goes wrong and they get blamed. And it doesn't matter what the reality is of whether this is effective or not. What matters is perception when you're dealing with parliamentarians a lot of the time, unfortunately. And so this is an incredibly difficult area to secure change in by going through your kind of normal lobbying processes. And we saw that very much with the Investigatory Powers Bill, now law, the Investigatory Powers Act. A lot of people in this room will remember we were all involved in a really intense fight. We were working day in, day out, lobbying in Parliament, trying to get amendments passed, trying to make the bill better. And the reality is we really didn't achieve very much, sad to say. Whereas this litigation, slow as it is, is the only area where we're actually seeing some changes. So we've already seen Dreeper getting struck down. Um, that's the Data Retention Investigative Powers Act because of David Davis and Tom Watson's case. And that was a real concrete achievement. And if we win this litigation in Strasbourg, so after this hearing on Tuesday, if we win, there, the government will not be able to escape making changes to the IP bill that we were unable to secure through parliamentary lobbying. Because although the case applies to the old framework, the principles which it's being decided on as to whether mass surveillance is proportionate will apply to the Investigatory Powers Act as well. And Liberty are currently, I don't know if any of you have seen, running a case through the domestic court. So they've got a judicial review challenge, which has been crowdfunded, which is fantastic. I think they raised 53,000 to bring the case, which I hope some of you in the room probably know about and heard about. That will now, it's got, they've had permission for the case to go ahead. As that runs through the courts, and then we get the judgment from Strasbourg, it's a pincher movement, which should hopefully be able to really actually force the change that we haven't been able to get through lobbying. So I know it's slow, it's frustrating, it just feels like sometimes you don't see much, but this is the only route we have. And also just to point out that, so we obviously Amnesty works across the world. In the Netherlands, some of you may have seen, they had a really repressive um, internet tracking law, which was passed in 2009. And they did a hell of a lot of lobbying trying to get rid of that bill. And all internet companies were, were going along with it. They were still picking up everyone's data. It was through litigation that they managed to kill it. They passed, they had a case in, I think it was 2014, run by an NGO called Privacy First. And that case in the High Court, because the High Court there has powers to quash legislation, they actually got rid of the Abusive Act in its entirety. And the government haven't been able to reinstate it since, although they're now doing a bit of tinkering. So litigation can work. Yeah, I would just um, second that, that despite the difficulties, it is a, a key tool and it's one of the most um, effective, which, show, which does eventually show concrete results. And I think the kind of external changes that you mentioned just make it increasingly important to um, pursue these challenges. And I think it will be very, um, it, the, the decision in the case um, will be very important and something we'll be looking to but it, um, you know, whatever that, would, it's something that, that the, the challenges and legislative challenges do, do get tr traction. Yeah, I mean, just try trying to explain politicians any of this stuff. I mean, you think it's hard for lawyers to get those of us with non-tech backgrounds? Try and explain it to politicians. It doesn't work, or at least not very effectively. Okay. I have a question that's quite close to that. Is, we've got the impression that, you know, for example, 
they've been uh, go to litigation. Sorry, they've been go to litigation. Mm -hmm. They lost. They changed the law. But it, changed, it seems that in the UK, some politician that were no, uh, in the home office previously, no prime minister, <laughs> want to do internet tracking and put a law in. Lost it. It takes five years, seven years for her to lose the, the battle. Mm -hmm. Change nothing in the law virtually. The wording knowing that she's lose, gonna lose it again in five years, but just go and progress and do the same thing again without any real change in the law, because each time they get condemned, they just mm. start the progress again, the process again. I mean, start the process again, perhaps, but the problem is what you're quite often doing is you're nibbling away. So the problem we have in the UK, which is different to in places like the Netherlands, is that when you run a case like this, based on the Human Rights Act, because you're challenging primary legislation, the courts here don't have a strike down power. So in the USA and in other places in Europe, if they find a piece of legislation to be in violation of basic rights, the courts can strike it out entirely. Here you don't have that. All the courts can do is make a declaration of incompatibility and it's then left to parliament and the government to bring forward the change. And that's for complicated reasons of parliamentary sovereignty. It's a bit different with EU law. And if anyone's involved in this, keeping an eye on the Brexit stuff at the moment, please keep pushing for us to retain the Charter of Fundamental Rights as my personal hobby horse, because the Charter and the strong rights to digital privacy in the Charter actually do empower our courts with a strike down, with a strike down power. So if you win a case like David Davis did using the EU Charter... Right? then you actually get to get rid of the abusive law. But what we're mostly doing is you're, you're getting a case, you're changing the principles, and then you're waiting for Parliament to make the change. And like you say, that does then leave gaps for the government to bring in another law, which isn't maybe perhaps quite as abusive as the last one, but it does become an iterative process, and things do get a bit better. Like we've seen with legal professional privilege, we got the government to concede a case in 2014, 2015. So we were challenging with Mr. Belhaj, who's a torture and rendition victim at Amnesty, the fact that the government, through all of this interception practice, were picking up legally privileged communications. And then the lawyers who were seeing those, the analysts were getting hold of them, passing them to lawyers. And there were no Chinese walls between departments. So those same lawyers could then end up working on the case of the individual suing the government for torture and abuse. And they've seen their legal advice. So we brought a challenge to that, and we won. We forced the government to concede the day before the hearing that their policies were unlawful, and they rewrote those policies. And in the Investigatory Powers Act, they've rewritten the way they do it. It's still rights abusive. It's still not quite there, but it's much better. So we are getting some change. It just takes time. Yeah, and I think that just because something is, is, is slow or challenging is... is you still have to, to keep doing it, and it, it does take time. And, and there are kind of quirks of the legal system, like mm. the, the fact that you have the declarations of incompatibility when it's UK law compared to, for example, in the, the devolved legislators, legislators, so for example, in Scotland, where something can, mm. a law can be struck down because it's incompatible with um, the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, but it is, um, it is that kind of bit by bit change and it's also related to the the discourse as well yeah hi uh, yeah i was actually going to ask a question about the charter um, issue which is that it seems like we have lost a lot of cases when they've been in the uk when we take them across and do them in Europe, then we're more likely to win. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, um, the UK government losing cases in Europe has been something they've used to, about why <laughs> we should leave Europe. So um, basically, is there a risk that winning these cases now is going to actually harm us in the long run of them just being like, well, this is European law, so eventually we'll just like disregard all of it because they're just telling us what to do? If, yeah. I've had that debate. God, this is like this is this is the debate that goes round and round between the teams who are running the Save the Human Rights Act campaigns at Amnesty and those of us who are more into the kind of issues. And yeah, it's a problem. It's of course it's a problem because every time you win a case in Strasbourg or you win a case in Luxembourg, that's exactly what happens: is you get pushback when you're in your meetings talking about saving our convention <laughs> rights, and you get pushback from the MPs saying, "Well, this is Europe telling us what to do." But then you see that actually when they lose cases here, it just becomes, oh, well, this is judges telling us what to do. The judges are the enemy of the people. And actually, they just, politicians just don't like being told what to do. 
So although the risk is there, I think on balance, we have to keep this fight because this is what international human rights law is there for. It's there to check governments when they go over the line. And we have to be aware of it. When we message, we're very careful with our public messaging to try and stay away from just talking about the European court. You know, there's not two of them, but we, we do think about how we message it. But it's hard. But and there's also the the flip side of that. The positive, if a case does go to the European Court of Human Rights, um, or there is, uh, for example, um, a reference to the uh, European Court of Justice, is it does increase the kind of visibility of the challenge and also the reach of um, the results of that challenge um, outside the UK, which, um, from international kind of human rights perspective, is a is a positive. Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, there's a. There, it seems to me that there's a another step in this process mm -hmm. where, supposing that we've established that in law something that has been happening shouldn't happen, or that hasn't been happening should, how do we make sure that it actually happens, particularly when the worst transgressors appear to be black agencies or at least highly secretive? <coughs> How much of a problem is this, and how do we deal with it? I, I mean, I think that links, um, like that kind of links all the things together in the sense of you need transparency in the first place to sometimes know that there's a problem, but then you need transparency after that to know how something's being dealt with, um, and and also it's the the kind of checks that are in in place, and I think that's why as as well as the kind of litigation against the legal frameworks. Um, another kind of um, tranche of this is, is pushing for, for more transparency so that you can find out, um, you know, for example, what intelligence sharing um, regimes are in place and um, pushing for oversight bodies to kind of have, have a stronger, um, stronger role as well. Um, because it, it's also kind of comes into kind of enforcement and the fact that um, that that change does happen and that the, the practices um, do reflect those changes and what, um, what's in the code of practice or what's in the law is actually um, put into practice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, parliamentary committees are one route. So we've got to try and go to the Intelligence Security Committee, try and push things forward. Writing lots of letters, lots of foyers. You tend to get a lot of pushback. This is all national security. But we've got the more transparency you can get built in, the better. And it's just an ongoing fight, really. Hi, um, so regarding the NSA, um, it's pretty well known now that GCHQ is surveying uh, British citizens, uh, thanks to Edmund Stone. But do we, so very few people or a lot less people are aware that Menworth Hill, for example, in the UK is actually owned by the NSA. Mm -hmm. So is anyone currently, le do they have any legal cases opposing NSA surveillance on, on either the UK or any other kind of foreign European country like Germany, for example, um, or any like NSA or any other? international intelligence agency uh, that's based in Oldbridge Hall? Um, I think so. I think that's something that um, is the kind of first step to push for kind of um, more transparency around the kind of legal basis for those operations. Um, and also, um, I think that it, I think it is something that the organisations are, are looking at, but it's um, there's not kind of a direct challenge at the moment. Yeah, I've not, I've not seen anything on the horizon, but it's something that everyone's looking at, particularly when we're talking about data sharing, and then we know that it's a revolving door between the two agencies anyway here in the UK, and I think it's definitely ripe for the next challenge. And um, th there's a there's a big debate as well going on in you know in a, in the US, for example, about their. Um, the, the reform of their legislation there and, and their kind of surveillance powers and also this kind of this uh, UK-US agreement as yeah. well. I think we just, uh, one more question? No. Nope. All done. Okay, time up, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, thank you all very much. Um, yeah. <laughs>